Well, we're moving along in our study of First Peter. We're going to finish the second chapter today. And in Christian circles, there are two words that have become rare in morning messages and uh, perhaps have, have been written off as words that Christians should know and understand, but I believe that the Bible says much about it and we should understand them. The first is submission and the second is suffering. And Christians are called to do both. And so I want to look at that in light of the scriptures today and see how that unfolds. We'll be dealing with it a little bit in the next few weeks. These are key words and so we'll uh, figure out how that works out in living our lives. He's going to talk about how to live as a citizen in a country and how to have submission and how to suffer when suffering comes upon you, what our attitude should be. And he's going to talk about other kinds of institutions uh, such as national leaders, governors, emperors, presidents, things like that. What should our response be? And he's going to talk about slave and master relationships or in today's terminology employer and employee relationships and how should that work. Then he's going to talk about husband and wife relationships. We'll begin to deal with that the two weeks after this message, the next week wives and the week after husbands. And then uh, relationships in general. How should we behave in society? In this chapter, Peter gives us three exhortations that will give us God's perspective on submission and suffering and what our response should be when we find ourselves in a position to submit or we find ourselves in a place of suffering. So let's look at them. The one's going to be the exhortation concerning submission and then the exhortation concerning suffering and then the exhortation concerning the Savior, that we look at the Savior to understand how this works. Now, if you remember last week when we ended the message, we talked about 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, where he says, Keep your conduct among Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. And so we're going to be looking at that exhortation concerning submission and how we can live this way in a fallen and broken world. Now look how he says that. He says that we should live in such a way that unbelievers will see our life and they will glorify God on the day of visitation when their life crumbles or falls apart or when they discover their need of a Savior, they will have had an example of godliness and as a result of that, they will be able to draw to God and understand what it is to give their heart to the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 then begins, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, and later we'll see to governors and all. But let's just pause there a moment. Did you notice that we're subject for the Lord's sake? We are doing what God tells us to do when we learn how to submit to authority. Be subject, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution. And that's important. That's because we're to do it for the Lord. But in reality, we also do it for ourselves. To learn subjection, to learn obedience, to learn how to properly respond in difficult circumstances is very good for you and for me. Look what 1 Peter 3.13 says. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? <clears throat> Here's a general principle. If you're a decent person and you learn how to respond to authority, you're not cocky and off the wall. Generally speaking, you get along with most people. Not everybody, because we live in a fallen world, but generally speaking, you function quite well in society if you have a sense of humility and you learn how to subject to yourself to authority. If you don't, then you'll find the opposite happens, and you'll have trouble in this world more than God intended for you because you have brought it on yourself because of bad 
behavior. So he goes on to say, not only do we subject ourselves to the emperor as supreme, but then in verse 14, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. There is a need for government and a need for leadership in any country. Imagine your country tomorrow with no government and no police. How safe do you think you would feel? It would be a very, very bad place to live. And so we need government, and, and he's telling them that we need to be subject to the government. Now let me just say something. Who was the emperor at the time that he's writing this? It was Nero. You know what Nero was famous for? Killing Christians. And yet he's writing, be subject to the emperor. And part of that was a protective thing. Because you see, if, if you mouthed off about Nero and word got to Nero, you know what you lost? You lost your life. And so he's, he's telling us how to survive and live in society. But then he says in verse 15, for this is the will of God. It's the will of God, what? That by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So Christians live differently in this world because we understand we live under the sovereignty of God and we live according to his direction. And the will of God is that we should live in a way that we learn to subject ourselves to, to those who have authority over us with a sense of humility. And in doing that, we, put to, we, put, we silence ignorant people who just mock you because you belong to Christ. So do not in your behavior. Do not give unbelievers a reason to criticize you because you behave badly. Make sure that your behavior does not cause people to mock the name of Jesus. Have you ever heard someone say, well, that's a Christian? We don't want them to say that. We want them to see a genuine response of a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, even when things are not going the believer's way, that our confidence is in Christ that we can respond differently. So don't give unbelievers a, a, a reason to criticize the church, our Savior, or anything like that. On the other hand, Christians behave when they are, they are mistreated. They should behave so differently from the world that we should be a blessing to the world. In fact, in general life, Christians ought to be blessings to other people all the time. And the Bible says even if we're mistreated, bless those who curse you. Bless and curse not. Do good to people that hurt you and harm you. We are to be living a different kind of life. And so you might say, well, you don't know what they've done to me. No, but I know what Christ commands us to do. He commands us not to return insult for insult or evil for evil, but instead to give a blessing. It's a different way of life, and it's what really identifies you as one having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to say in verse 16, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. These writing to Jewish Christians mostly have, been, have come to Christ and they now realize they're not under the law and all that legalistic system. But he's saying, don't use your freedom carelessly. Be respectful and mindful of other people. And even something may be legitimate, it may not be the right thing to do at the right time because someone that's with you may be offended by that behavior. So don't do it. It's a simple thing to say, I don't mind yielding a privilege for the purpose of demonstrating Christ in my life. And so he tells us that we're to be, live a certain way. Freedom on earth is good, but not the bottom line. Now, he's going to be writing to servants, and, and, and so we know that uh, there, was, there was slavery in that day, and we have, we have slavery in our day. Uh, you might not know it, but do you punch a time clock? Imagine going into your boss on Monday and saying, you know, I've been thinking that. I really don't like the way things work here. And so I know that you want me in at 9, but from now on, I think I'll come in at 10, because I like to sleep in that extra hour. What do you think will happen? Yeah, bye-bye. You'll find that you, you, you either conform to the system or you're going to be out. 
And it's very important. However, if you can get freedom, if, and, and this works economically too, 1 Corinthians 7, 21, were you a bond slave when you were called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Verse 22, for he who was called in the Lord as a bond servant is a freeman of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bond servant of Christ. So if you're a bond servant, you're really free in your spirit. You're free in your heart. You're not really under the controllership of men. You're under the controllership of the Spirit of God. And there's a sense of well-being, even in difficult circumstances. But then he says, if you belong to Jesus, you're really a bondservant. You report to Jesus. You say, he is my master. He is my Lord. I bow before him, and I do what he tells me to do. That's the understanding that he's getting across to us. And then he says in verse 17, here's how you should behave then. Honor everyone. Honor everyone. I was talking about Gary Smalley in the first service, who teaches husbands how to honor their wives. And he, and he says, when your wife walks in the room, you should do something like this. <gasps> I can't believe we're in the same room together. Hey, listen, guys, it works. I've been married 47 years. It pays to honor your wife. And, and, and so it pays to honor everybody. It, it pays to be respectful. I... I am thankful that some of the early years of my life were spent in an orphanage because what I learned in those early years was that this, yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir. I'm glad I learned that by age four. I can only tell you how wonderful it's been through life knowing how to respond to authority. And so he says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, Honor the emperor. Nero? Honor means respect for the position that they hold. Have you ever seen on YouTube some silly person who gets pulled over by a policeman who begins cursing at the policeman? Now, is there any logical sense in that? I mean, to me, are you kidding? So the policeman tears off one ticket, and what's he do next? Oh, you want me to keep writing? And, and what sense? And so he's trying to tell us how to live in society. When you honor people, even difficult people, it's better. And so he tells us to honor people for the sake of Christ, to demonstrate that we are under his control. The Spirit of God leads and guides and directs us. Submission is an act of humility that recognizes authority. And every person is under some kind of authority. And we need to recognize that, and we need to learn how to live under that authority. And when I submit, I put myself under that authority. And you'll find life will go much better. Non-submission leads to chaos and disorder in society and in your own personal life. We need to learn how to be a submissive people. Now, Christians, generally, if we are living the Christian life, generally, Christians are the best citizens in any country. They give, they care, they minister to people, they're gracious, and that's a very good thing. And we want that to be that way. Also, Peter wants the government to stay out of the churches. If you keep poking somebody, guess what they're going to do? They're going to poke back. And so how you treat other people, and, and, and how, how you, if, you, if you go around criticizing all the time and mocking all the time, don't be surprised if it comes back to you. And so Peter says, no, no, that's not what Jesus wants you to do. It's not the way to live. You're supposed to live submissive and have the right attitude. Now, it doesn't mean that you're a doormat and that you never uh, go contrary to what the government might say. There's, there's certain principles in Scripture, and Peter's not overriding those principles. Here's the highest principle of Scripture. If God wills it, you should do it. If God wills it, you should do it. And that's important for us to understand. And so let me give you some examples of how this works. <clears throat> Hebrews 11:23, when Pharaoh <clears throat> said, kill all the young infant children, here's what happened. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Here's the rule of thumb. Submit to authority, 
unless authority tells you to do something that causes you to disobey God. God always overrides any human authority that comes in our life. And so therefore, I submit the authority graciously as far as I can. But if I'm told to do something that is contrary to God's will, God's will always trumps the authority of the land. Let me give you another example. Daniel was uh, second in command in Babylon, and he was a uh, 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 honest politician, doing the right things. And all the other politicians around him were jealous of him, and they, they, they wanted to destroy him. And so they came up with this clever idea. Let me read it to you in, in, in Daniel 6.5. These men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against Daniel. And that's how it ought to be in our lives. There should be no ground for complaint in our lives that people can bring against us unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. And so then they went to uh, Nebuchadnezzar in verse 7. Uh, All the high officials of the kingdom and the precepts and the and the satraps and the counselors and the governors all agreed that the king would establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast in the den of lions. O king, if they worship anybody but you in the next 30 days, they should be executed. And so they thought they had Daniel, and so they're watching him. Now I want you to notice Daniel's behavior. Even though this is a rule of the government, Listen to his behavior. Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, so he was fully aware, this has now become the law of the land. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. So now he's in the house and he's at a window. And then it says, he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Notice this next line as he had done previously. In other words, he was a faithful man. It's not like don't get on a bandwagon when a law comes about that you haven't been spiritually concerned about. No, no. Daniel was a man of faith that was always on his knees praying before God. They knew exactly what he was going to do. The law was passed. What does Daniel do? He says, I report to a higher authority. There is the law of the land, and wherever I can obey it, I will obey it, and I will submit to it. But when the law of the land takes me beyond the will of God, I will do the will of God. He gets on his knees and he prays. And of course, you know the rest. He's thrown in the lion's den, and and of course, he survives quite well, and his accusers are later thrown into the lion's den, and they don't do so well, because God is in control. And Daniel understood that. Let me give you another example. Acts chapter 4, verse 18. The apostles are preaching about the resurrection of Christ. Very, very exciting. And so uh, when they're preaching, the religious leaders of that day call them in, and they're upset about the preaching. It says, so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. If someone tells you you can't talk about Jesus, you have God's permission to disobey that. Because God tells us to speak about Jesus. When God's rules are higher than the governmental rules. And we obey God's rules first. And so in verse 19, but Peter and John, so Peter is the one who wrote this about submission, but he understands there's a limit to that. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. But we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And so they release them. Now what do you think they do? They're told to shut up. No way. They go out and they begin preaching. And now the officials arrest them again. They're upset. In Acts 5.27, when they, heard, when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in his name, yet you, here you are, you filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And now listen to what Peter says. Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. And so that's the principle. Obey the government. Submit to the government. Do what you're told to do. Be a good citizen. But if the government tells you to do something that violates your commandments that God gives you, don't do it. Rather say, I'll take what comes my way. It could cost you your life in some countries. 
but don't do it. Don't deny God. Be faithful to what he commands you to do. Now, we have some examples of how that works. And remember Martin Luther King? Uh, he violated some laws by having civil disobedience. Now, it was peaceful. It was respectful. It was not, it, it was not an armed mob. It was a peaceful, respectful disobedience. What you are doing to men is wrong. God says it's wrong, and I can't participate in it. And so he marches, and then we all remember his famous uh, speech, I had a dream. And it changed the culture of our land. That's the right way to object to something. The wrong way, let's say a Christian is counter to abortion, which we are, and he gets the idea he's going to blow up an abortion clinic. That would be the wrong way of dealing with it. The right way of that might be volunteer at a crisis pregnancy center, entertain conversations with people, use your ballot to do what you can to change the, the law of the land. There are some things we can do, but we cannot counter bad behavior that way. That would be a wrong thing to do. Write this in your mind. We should never do wrong to correct wrong. We should never do wrong to correct wrong. So the exhortation concerning submission. We are in a general sense to submit to those in authority over us. We know where the line is drawn when that authority tells us to violate something that God tells us is wrong. We cannot do that. And then the exhortation concerning suffering. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters, notice this now, with all respect. He's telling servants to be subject to their masters with all respect. And then he adds this line, not only to the good and gentle, and you know, in this culture that he's writing in, uh, in Rome, every two, every, out of three citizens, two were slaves. And some of the slaves were very good. They were doctors, they were lawyers, because they, they were in a household where the, the master was very good and very helpful and educated folks. That was great. He says, but have respect for all of them, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust. In other words, respect even the unjust. Now, we could translate that today and say in employees and employers. Have you ever had an employer that mistreated you? Or a boss that, that did not do right by you? What does it say here? It says you're to treat them with respect. They are your boss. You are to treat them not with a bunch of lip and, and not with a bunch of wisecrackers, but with respect. Because that's what the Bible demands of us. We are to be a respectful people. We are to be a people that uses our lips with grace. We are to choose our words with care so that we do not dishonor the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's very, very important. Now, what would happen? You've got a boss who's coming down on you in a situation that seems so unfair, and yet God is telling you to speak graciously and to be kind. What is God doing? Well, look what he says in chapter 2, verse 19. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures suffering while suffering unjustly. Mindful that God is watching. Mindful that God is the final judge. Mindful that every man, woman, will give an account to the living God. Mindful that God is in control of my life. I can be respectful in a difficult situation. Because I am convinced that God is in control. Now that gives us great ability to do the right thing. And it says, when one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Yes, in life you sometimes are unjustly treated. How should you respond as a believer? You should respond as one who is confident in Christ and who obeys Christ. Therefore, you will not return insult for insult or evil for evil. But you will respond differently, different than the world would respond. The world says, you do me, I'll do you. But the Bible says, leave it with God. Leave it with God. Now notice what he says in verse 20. What credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? In other words, if you talk back and you scream, you yell, you argue, you throw things, and, and you get in trouble, what did you do? He says you, 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 you brought it on to yourself. 
your behavior. And, and when you return, you know, it, when, my mother used to say it takes two to tangle. Do you remember that? Two to tangle. You know, if, if you got the idea, if, if, you, if you, you know, soft answers will turn away wrath, grievous words stir up anger. Don't stir it up and, no, no, no. Don't you dare talk to me that way. Don't you, no, no, no. no. Talk in a Christian way and reason from the scriptures and use your soft answers turn away wrath. Use your tongue to calm the situation down. But he goes on to say, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, notice this next line. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Did you notice that? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Who are you trying to please? Oh, I'm trying to please God. Well, what makes God pleased? Your behavior. Your understanding of how he set things in order. Your understanding that he's sovereign. And on that day of judgment, everyone will give an account of their lives. Your confidence in him that you don't have to take matters into your hand knowing that God has them under control. And you may suffer, you may feel pain, you may even lose your life. Because there are many Christians today losing their life as there always has been since the church has started. But you can be assured of this. Every promise of God will come true for you and you will stand before him on that day and you will be receiving his well done because you did it his way and he, you have put your faith and trust in him. So there's the exhortation concerning submission and then the exhortation concerning suffering. But then there's the example of the Savior. You say, does anybody do this? Is this how we really can live? And then he says, yeah, I want you to know that you can do it and I want to give you an example, and that example is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in 1 Peter 2.21, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. You've got an example. You say, who can I see that's actually doing this? Watch the life of Christ. Study the life of Christ. In this fallen and broken world, when you and I are mistreated, we want to know what our reaction should be. And here's what our reaction should be. Follow in his steps. React the way Jesus would react. Do the things Jesus would do. And look what it says in 1 Peter 2.22. Nobody was more innocent than the Lord Jesus Christ. But it says he committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. If anyone did not deserve to suffer, it was Jesus. If anyone deserved to be treated with respect and dignity, it was Jesus. Yet, no deceit was found in his mouth. But notice what happened in verse 23. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Now, if anyone could have struck him dead, it would have been Jesus. But when he was reviled, he did not revile in turn. When he suffered, notice what he didn't do. He did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Listen, God is able to straighten out a situation far better than you are. Our response is to be Christian and to respond with dignity, with humility, with speech that is well chosen. And that's a very important thing. And God will judge justly. And we can entrust ourselves. We can, we, can, we can look at the end game and we can say, God will judge justly. And so he goes on to say in verse 24, here's what Jesus did for us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Jesus died so we don't have to live like unbelievers. We can live unto him and we can live a holy life and we can learn what it is to be under the control and the power of the Holy Spirit. So he himself bore our sins in his body on a tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Healed of what? Now, here's the problem. When Christians today hear the word healed, what do they think of? Oh, I'm feeling better already. I'm healed. And that's really not what these verses talk about at all. And this is a quote from Isaiah. And so many Christians emphasize physical healing and never really understand that what Jesus came to do was to heal your soul. Your body will get changed. 
but not on earth. I promise you, you will get old. You'll begin to say, what's happening to me? Your teeth may become fewer. Your walk will become slower. Your eyes will become dimmer. And you can pray all day long, and you're still going to get what? Old. It's just going to happen, because we're going to heaven where we get new bodies and a new life. And, but you're going to get old. But notice what it says in chapter 53, verse 5 of Isaiah. This is what he's quoting, and this is how they, so many miss it. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. And people say, oh, I'm claiming my healing. I'm claiming my healing. No, no, that's not what this verse is talking about. This verse is saying, not that you are physically healed, but that you are spiritually healed. We are spiritually broken people before Christ. When Christ comes into our life, we are spiritually healed. What are we healed of? A wicked, sinful disposition, an obedient, a disobedient nature. And we are healed, and now by the Holy Spirit of God, have the ability to live a righteous life godly life. And that's what Christ did for us. And no physician, I don't care how famous he is, no physician can cure men of sin. Only the great physician. And that's what Jesus Christ did for us. And he healed us. And so he goes on to say in Peter, 1 Peter 2.25, for you were straying like sheep. See, it's a spiritual issue. You were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now again, what is Peter doing? Well, he's quoting Isaiah again. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. That's the fallen sinful nature. We have turned each one to his own way. And what did the Lord do? The Lord laid on him, that's Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus went to a cross he suffered abuse. He was willing to be mocked. He was willing to be mistreated so that you and I could have redemption. And so he dies on the cross. Why? So that we can be healed. That's why Peter says, again, let's look at that verse. For you are straying like sheep. You are sinful and misbehaving and living poorly. And you now return to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. The word returned in Scripture is sometimes translated converted. Converted. How do you know you are converted? We well, said, well, I said a prayer. That doesn't mean anything. Dozens of people pray to receive Jesus that really have no idea what they're doing. And we get them up here and we want to get, no, no. Listen, the way you know you are converted is your life changes. If you pray and you do not have a change of life. Lord, I, I want you to save you. And then you go out and you live any old way. You, no, no, you're not converted. Converted people live differently. They live under the control of the Spirit of God. They are willing to live this way, even when they are suffering, even when they are in submission to someone who may not be kind or gracious. They still display the love of Christ and the power of Christ in their lives. So on the day when that person comes to a crisis, they will know and they will say, I have actually seen Christianity demonstrated. I have seen people who actually believe what they say they believe and they live it. They live it, and, and, and I, I, man, I'm in trouble. I know who to go to. And God will use you to bring people to himself because they will have, for the first time in their life, recognized what genuine Christianity is all about. When you had a chance to be angry, return evil for evil, strike back. Instead, you reflected Jesus Christ. And they'll come to you in that day, and they'll talk to you. And here's the bottom line. No one can submit in the way that Peter tells us. And we're going to talk about next week, wives. We're going to talk about husbands the next week and, 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 and how these situations work out. You can't do it until the Spirit of God is in control of your life. And you've been thoroughly converted by Christ. Then 
you can learn how to submit. It's really not a problem to say, yes, sir, no, ma'am. It's not a problem to submit unto authority when Jesus Christ is your highest authority. And you'll learn how to suffer. The Bible tells us that if you would live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer. People will make fun of you. Family members will, will mock you. You'll find that old friends will no longer want to hang with you. And you will suffer. And yet you will suffer in such a way that you'll bring glory to Christ. And you'll follow his example. And a thirsty world will come to you in the day of need. What's our example? Jesus. Look at what Jesus did. What would happen if when Jesus was being brought to Calvary, he said, enough. I'm done with you. What would happen if Jesus did not submit to the will of the Father? Where would you and I be? Where would our hope be? And the answer is we'd have none. And so what Peter is saying is the least you can do if you name the name of Jesus is follow his example. And that will involve submission and suffering for the glory of God. But it also will involve fruitfulness, touching the lives of others with the gospel because you will be seen as authentic. And authentic people reach people for Christ. Let's pray together. Father, help us to live this way that Peter has so clearly laid out in Scripture. It's so contrary to the way the natural man feels. And it's certainly not the way of the world, but is the way of Christ. And we carry his name, and we pray that we will live in that way that glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and God bless you.